Other than that, listen, guys, we got a guest speaker today. His name's Chad. This is Chad. Everybody say hi, Chad. Hi, guys. And, uh, and listen, y'all, he deserves your attention, all right? You guys may not respect me enough to, you know, not talk while I'm talking, but you should respect him enough to talk, not talk while he's talking, all right? Let's listen to Chad. He's got something to say. Uh, appreciate it. I thought I brought enough papers, but I think I might run out. So uh, there's a couple reasons why I'm here today. I'm going to pass these around. I got these from St. Jude. Just take one, pass them down. If you don't, if there aren't enough, you could just use a scrap of paper. So that's going to be for questions and maybe questions you're not feeling comfortable to ask, and that's okay. So there's two. Well, there's ma a main reason why I'm here today, and that's to talk about apologetics. But it's from something that Pastor Don said in one of his sermons. He said two things. He said, well, first off, how many are planning to go to, go to college? Anybody? Well, you might not have the plan yet, but maybe it's an idea in your future. All right, you can put your hands down. So statistically, half of you in here that want to go to college will lose your faith when you go to college. Now, why is that? That's... That's a st yeah, it's a statistic. You guys are more than a statistic. I think you could stack the deck against that. The other thing he said was, Wicca is the fastest growing religion in America right now. And Wicca tends to grab onto those that don't know any better. And Wicca is a very dangerous philosophy. So I'm going to talk about those two things. So what is apologetics? Does anybody know? All right, well, some of you have Bibles, and that's awesome. And you're sitting in the front row, too. Can you open your Bible to 1 Peter 3.15? And you guys bold enough to read? Anybody? Anybody you want to read 1 Peter 3.15 for me? Could you do that? First Peter three fifteen. All right, he got his hand up first. Just to avoid ultimate chaos, hands would be great instead of just shouting out. Though I don't mind shouting out questions; it's not too terrible. Got it? Oh, he's got it. He raised his hand first, so he gets to he gets the kiss of death. I'll call on you later. First Peter three fifteen. I have it. All right, can I can I switch it to her? She's got it. All right, he, he, go ahead. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for hope that gives for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Okay, so that's like the center point for apologetics. When people see your life and they ask you why you are the way you are. You give your apologia. It's a Greek word. It means to give an answer. You're not saying, I'm sorry, I'm a Christian. You're saying, here's why I am what I am. That's apologia. The other part of that verse is always be ready. Um, I just hit, I've been two years into my 40s now. Uh, and so when do you guys think the brain stops developing? You have an idea? 25. About 25, 26. Very good. That's when the rate of growth and the rate of decay kind of switch. So you have to be intentional. What is the number one way to maintain sharp cognitive function even into your 80s or 90s? You guys have any idea? How do you keep yourself smart and sharp? Practice what you know. Somebody say reading. Reading comprehension. Reading comprehension can actually stave off mental disease like dementia, stuff like that. You read. So you're using the logical part of your brain and you're using the imaginative part of your brain, they're interacting. So reading is good, but it doesn't help you stay sharp. Anybody else? Medication. Medication. Well, <laughs> I would say to a point. Um, we are naturally not meant to be medicated for our entire lives. That, that's not work? Wordle. Wordle? Wordle. 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 What, I, I, I'm ignorant. What? How can I? Oh. That's actually pretty close. The, the, so those are like brain games, right? All right, one more. Um, just basic activities like shopping. They help you do math and stuff. Because you... you guys are sort of there. Actually, it's, it's a little bit foreign to that. So that's the Wordle games. 
They are proven to make you better at the world games. That's about all they do. If you want to maintain sharp cognitive function into your 80s even, and I know that's a long way off, but I'm halfway there, it's cardiovascular exercise. Blood flow to the brain. You have to fuel your brain, and if you don't fuel your cardio system, blood doesn't go up there, and things start to die faster than they grow. You can keep learning and keep growing and keep teaching up into your 80s. You just have to be intentional with it. That's kind of how life is. You have to be intentional with it. So when we go back to 1 Peter 3.15, always be ready to give an answer. That kind of assumes you're going to be intentional with your faith too. You're going to be studying your scriptures and what is true and what is not true. Does that make sense? All right, well, we're going to test this because I got, I think, half of you looking up here, and that's kind of good. Is anybody good at push-ups? No, we like no body strength. How about how about squats? We can do squats. Okay. Everyone, right, stand up for a minute. We're gonna we're gonna help ourselves out. Uh, you can do these. We're gonna do jump squats. <laughs> so we're here. We're gonna come down here. We're gonna go up. Now, nope. right here, guys. One of my other passions is martial arts. Martial arts is my second favorite thing to do. So we're going to jump, we're going to be here, we're going to go, we're going to touch our knees to our chest, we're going to come back down. We're going to do five of these, like this. Easy, right? You, can, you guys can do this. Well, we're using our legs. All right, let's do, th we'll start out with three. Let's start out with three. All right, ready? One. Two. Three. All right, so we're going to, you guys ever seen the movie Trolls? Yeah. So now we're going to pretend, because you know, it's half martial arts, we're going to pretend we're going to kick trolls in the head. So when you come up, you're going to go whack, right back down. Right? One. Two. Three. All right, that's good. All right, sit down, sit down. <laughs> All right, so I got some of you. So biogenics is all about asking questions. There are certain questions which are tough. How many of you have, uh, I guess, friends that are unbelievers? Right? It's good if you, if you have friends that are unbelievers. So that's kind of an identity conflict, right? You feel maybe like you're an odd person now. Something like that. So what if they ask you a question? Why do you believe this? Hard questions like, how can you believe in a book that was written by a man? Man is fallible. How do you know the Bible's true? How does a good God allow so much evil in the world? These are the questions, and this is why I read, got the paper down there. Uh, I'll have you hand them in later. If you're not comfortable asking them, then we'll answer them later. Why get married? That's a good one these days. I think it's like 47, 48% of all marriages end in divorce, and it's going up. Well, it's kind of tapering, to be honest. Why stay married? So those are the tough questions you want to be asking yourself. Because who's apologetics for? Well, go ahead. Okay. What's your answer? Okay, so what is love? What does that look like? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, these the questions often go into other questions because that's where the conversation goes to place. So apologetics, who is it for? Apologetics is all about the conversation with someone who does not believe. Apologetics is for yourself. It's for defense. It's putting on armor. So when someone rails against you, like a question like, Why did why did God take my grandmother? I mean, that's a harsh question, right? Why would he do that? You would have an answer for now the first question you would ask to something like that would be how long ago did this happen because the last thing someone needs who just lost a family member is a logical answer they just need you to be there and to suffer with them yes i was ready to take her home if someone was very sensitive and did not believe in god that might not work for them but if they open up to you enough to talk about death then you probably have a good relationship with them. It's very circumstance pending. <laughs> so using a lot of the apologetics, we use this tool called philosophy. 
Is, that, is anybody named Sophia in here? Wow, that's, that's neat. Is your name Sophia? What does Sophia mean? That's right. What is philo? Philo. Philosophy. Philo Sophia. It's Greek. So the Greeks have four words for love. They have eros, storge, agape, and phileo. So eros is man and woman, husband and wife. Storge is love of a parent to a child. Agape is more abstract. Christ talks about love to the Father. He says it's more agape love goes up. And then phileo. Phileo is brotherly love. Philadelphia, city of brotherly love. You're standing beside somebody. Um, and man, maybe you can understand this. If you are in a shootout, a legit shootout with somebody, and you survive, you will be their friend forever. Because you went through crisis together, aiming a certain direction. So the idea is philosophy. We are standing beside wisdom, going toward a target. Does that make sense? No? <laughs> but it, well, that is, that is the idea. The whole book of Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, they're written for this, too. So that's philosophy. One of my passions has always been to have conversations with other people. My passions are not very lucrative. I work in a warehouse. I'm a forklift driver. That's pretty fun. You get to talk to a lot of different people that keep coming in. Turnover rate's pretty high. So I like to have conversations with them about the highest possible thing. Um, some of the questions that they ask are some of the questions that have been asked a long time ago. Like, like I posited earlier, how can a good God allow so much suffering in this world? Right? That's a question about will and free will. But before we get on to the question part, if you guys have written one down, um, I can go over some of the common ones later. And if you could, I don't have a clock anywhere. Oh, you put the verse up there. Thanks. Uh, give me like a five-minute mark or something like that. I appreciate it. So we're gonna, I want to at least go over Wicca and why that's so popular and why it kind of draws people in. Does anybody know anything about Wicca? Yeah. Uh, that, that's more Shintoism. There's a spirit of everything, and that's more, that's ways. So Wicca has a very popular philosophy, love of wisdom. Their wisdom, their basic philosophy was made in the 1950 by uh, Gerald Gardner. And he said he was baptized in the witch's coven in England, somewhere around there. They, that's unverifiable. And so that's what, like two generations off, something like that? And so what we have now, if you ask, so they're witches, right? Wicca, witches. If you ask any coven what their beliefs are, you will get a unique answer for their ritual from every single one. They've splintered off. They don't have a center anymore. But they all go under the same philosophy. It's, very, it's pagan as well. And the philosophy is do no harm and do what you will. Is that a good philosophy? Do no harm. Do no harm. Well, you're not supposed to do harm. So as long as you're not doing harm, you can do whatever you want. Okay. You are right. It depends on your definition of harm. That's, that's very correct. So Augustine said something else that's kind of a counter to it. And he was one of the first people that wrote down an apologetic response. I think it was called the City of God. And this was a long time ago. It was a response to paganism infiltrating the Judeo-Christian worldview. And he said, love God and live your life. What's the difference between those two? Do no harm and love God. What's the difference? Because you can live your life doing no harm to the best of your ability. You can willfully blind yourself. Technically, I'm not harming the planet when I do this. Therefore, everything is fine. And so you start reasoning with yourself. So one goes in the negative. One says, do not. The other one says, do. One has an aim. The thing about our God is he is the ideal. He is the aim. We always aim up. Um, you guys remember the Tower of Babel story? So in the Tower of Babel story, they were building a city without God. 
They wanted to make a name for themselves. Literally is what it says in the story. So they're not aiming anywhere. They already have it right there. Yes. They sure were. They were building it as high as they could. High as possible. There's a lot of reasons they think. Maybe they were trying to build it so high they could survive another flood. They were trying to make a monument to themselves, whatever that looked like. Um, it's a very interesting story. It's probably one of the ones I'd really like to read and think about a lot. There's a, there, in Jewish literature, when you read deep into the story, they say, when a person would fall from the top of the Tower of Babel, the people would not care. But if a brick would fall, the people would groan because it would take a year to get that brick to the top. So if you have a city without God, and our society is roughly like that, we have a very secular environment, our social circles, sorry, not circles, I guess, our social environment's secular, it's without God, you devalue people and you value things way more. That's the Tower of Babel. That's the city without God. And no one's doing any harm if someone just happens to fall off, right? I mean, it's their fault they fell off. Christ actually said a parable about this. About doing no harm versus actually loving your neighbor. So who is my neighbor? You guys remember the Good Samaritan? Sort of, where it's supposed to be wise as serpents and gentle as doves. So a somebody who's trying to stab you with a knife, maybe time out for friendship while you take care of the situation, and then we maybe you can make friends after that. That's right. So I, I once went around my warehouse and I asked every single person there, what do they think about Jesus? And usually when you ask that question, you get so many interesting answers. The, one of the answers I got from a person, um, his name was Eric, he said, I really don't like all the rules and religion. Like, that's interesting. So my response to him was, Christ's most fierce words were toward the Pharisees, who were all about the law. He's like, I had no idea. So the Good Samaritan, right? There's a person who is beaten, and then you have, who walks by him? You have a priest, and then who else? A Levite, and then a Samaritan sees him and takes, has compassion on him, takes pity on him, helps him out. So those two people who walked by, they could have been Wiccans. They were doing no harm. He's already beaten right in front of them. They just keep walking. But as Augustine said, and as we should do, love your neighbor as yourself, love God first. Right? Set aside Christ as Lord is what it said in 1 Peter 3.15. You're going to want to help him. Why is that? Because he helps you. they would be defiled, then they couldn't go into the temple. That was the, the Levites and the priests. That was their logic. That was his issue. I'm not hurting him technically. This is where you can reason yourself on the specifics. There, uh, so in the, these are good questions. The, um, the priests and the Levites, they had to go through certain cleansing ceremonies. They would touch a body or blood. They would have to wash themselves and then be separate for like seven days. And they couldn't partake in the cultural customs of the day. Uh, they had very strict laws that would govern this kind of stuff. And the Jews are, are pretty interesting. They're, uh, they also have, see, they have the Torah, and I think it's called the, the Manisha, and then they have one more. There's like three layers of laws they have that make sure they don't violate the core values of the laws or well, cleansing rites. But the law is very interesting. When you're a child, and I guess technically you can kind of count yourself there, but you won't be. You have potential to be something greater, which I believe you all will be someday. Your parents tell you things like, don't run in the street. I have a six-year-old. She would do this. Why do they tell you this stuff? Do you know any better? 
Can you, if you, how many of you have younger brothers or sisters? I mean, how many have you seen? So are they like age six or below? Are they aware of anything that goes on in the world? They will just run into traffic. So, I mean, is that, I don't know, my, my daughter has crazy hair and runs. Her, her favorite thing to do is sit in a swing and spin herself for like 20 minutes at a time. And I'm not even kidding. My wife and I watched her. She just kept doing it. She's, she is like the opposite of vertigo. She just walks straight after doing that. It's just the weirdest thing to watch. But yeah, she is. She, so when you're young, your brain is underdeveloped. As you get older, this is why the brain development thing is so important. You have to recognize that in yourselves. You are still growing mentally. When you are four, you cannot see angles. You cannot see this. It's a concept your brain cannot fathom. You watch kids try to draw angles. They can't. They have to do like boxes. And that gives me hope, right? Because we're still contained in this little... Yeah, I'm not kidding. That's, that's, that's something that kids cannot... They, can't, they have no idea what angles are. You're like four, but they can walk and they can sort of talk and all that stuff, but they have no idea. Have them draw an X. It'll look like a plus sign. It's their brains are just not wired yet. And you were all like that, and so was I. So if that's how limited they are, you can imagine us for eternity after, being, after having this flesh cast off. Like, who knows what's going to happen after that, man? It's going to be pretty awesome. But we're given law to begin with. I tell my child, sorry you can't ride your bike well, down, the, down the block. Do you have a question? Are you just saying hi? So you can't ride your bike. Why can't I have my six-year-old ride down the block? Is that because I'm trying to be a tyrant? Yeah, <laughs> I'm an authoritarian daddy. No, I... I Probably don't want her to get hit by a car, right? She has trouble remembering to break. So when she's going around a corner, hey, would I be a good parent if I said, yeah, go ahead, enjoy? Probably not. So the law is given when we're young, mentally young. We're given that to, for our survival. But after that, you have to have an aim, especially when you're trying to figure out your purpose in life which direction you want to go. You want to go to college. You want to go to the military. You want to go to the workforce. The workforce and the military are also preaching the same message as the colleges and the professors. Right? They've had a very long time to think about their atheism. When you get into a place like that, they've been, they'll have been thinking about it for 20 years. And so one of the reasons I'm here right now is because I think one of the ways we can get rid of that 50% mark is to give you a little bit more than Sunday school knowledge when taking on these hard questions in opposition. Yes? I don't know. I wouldn't be surprised, but I really haven't looked into that. <laughs> um, so why, do you know, that's a, that's a very good point, though. Why did we put in God we trust? Do you guys know why we put in God we trust on our money? Do you know why, Josh? Why they no? <laughs> so it was a, uh, from what I understand, it was a direct counter to communism that was going on in Russia. I don't think it was Reagan; it might have been before him. But in Russia, they were flirting with actually no, they were doing communism. And this is actually one of the great examples in our time. Uh, did you guys learn anything about Russia in school so far? Anybody? They learn, what did you learn about? So what is communism? It's basically the belief that whether you work super hard and you work with everything you can or you don't have a job and you just get paid, everyone should be able to have Equity of outcome. Everybody is the same. Does that sound right? Okay. Yeah, we have equity of outcome. Well, there kind of was, it was called the Cold War, right? And who came out on top? The capitalism or the communism? Well, capitalism, roughly speaking, Russia is still in shambles. So communism, that you have to get rid of God because that's a higher power than the government. The government is making your decisions for you. You can live a content life like that if you wish not to grow and be a slave. They have to get rid of God. 
It is a godless country. The only way capitalism works, in my opinion, is if we're undergirded by spiritual values that gives the individual dignity. Yeah? Something like that? So there's this guy named Alexander Solzhenitsyn, and he wrote this uh, book called The Gulag Archipelago, and it's pretty deep. It explains exactly what happens in a communistic society. And his whole point of it, he wrote three volumes. I only read the one, but I, I'm going to read the other two. Is that what happens is mass slavery is just rampant in the country because people are no longer valued. You guys have heard of the Holocaust. I, I hope so. So you learned a bit about Germany. So how many, how many people were killed in the Holocaust? Roughly. I mean, about six million. So if you put an extra zero on that number, that's how many Russia and China killed with communism. And we don't see that because we weren't at war with them. There's a lot of reasons why we don't see that, because the thought and ideal of communism is such a utopia. But there's something that you've got to understand. This is why I think heaven's always in the future. At least it should be, something you aim for. Every time we try to force heaven on here, on this planet, mass bloodshed happens. It became illegal in Russia to complain. Imagine that. You're complaining about something. You complain about, I don't get paid enough. You go to the Gulag. The Gulag's a slave labor camp for 25 years. That's what you do. And that's their country, and everybody told on everybody. So you have, you have to start lying. That's part of your daily life. Kids would go with their parents. That's a problem. You learn real quick not to complain. <laughs> it depends what you're complaining for, what you're complaining to. But yes, the, the, there was a quota that had to be met. So to pull this back to apologetics and pull this back to philosophy, we want to be on the side of truth. Yes. Oh, five minutes. Thank you. So what is truth? What is truth? Someone was asked this question once. It's in the Bible. You guys know? Do you know who asked this question? No. It's uh, So Christ was about to be up for judgment. And Christ said to Pilate, those on the side of truth, listen to me. And Pilate asked him, what is truth? What did Christ say? And he didn't have a chance to say anything. Pilate just turned and walked away. He was not concerned about the answer. So if you're on the side of truth, you listen to Christ. You, have it, you aim a certain direction. From what I can see, you get truth based on your best evidence and just like life, life has to be intentional. You have to be intentionally seeking after truth. Will you survive if you stop drinking water? Probably not. I would say your chances of survival if you stop drinking water is zero. Same with eating food, eventually, for some. Right? Because you have to be intentional with life to live. You have to take, for hygienics purposes, take showers. If you don't do this stuff, well, that's a problem. So you have to be on the side of truth. Yo, paper airplanes, I love it. I'm going to give you guys some homework. And it's optional, yes? Oh, you're on. You just say, you're just, give me a high five. Oh. So I'm going to give you guys some homework. Um, it's optional for sure. I can't hold you accountable. So I'll be here next week as well. And I'm going to come with some preloaded questions. Maybe I can help you out that you can deal with at the level you are right now, or at least prep you for college. And your homework is someone that does not believe one of your friends, ask them why they don't. And you don't have to engage in dialogue with them. Ask them why. Why, aren't you, why don't you follow Christ? They could say something like, I just don't go to church. I don't see the problem with it. I don't understand. But ask somebody, just, just why not? You're like, why don't you come to church with me? Or why don't you believe? And what do you think about Jesus? Something like that. Ask them that question. And then you can write it on that paper. And we'll take care of it next week. And next week, it's going to be, I'll tell you maybe a little bit about my story. Because I've talked with Muslims, people from China, some Hindi people as well. Lots of atheists. There's a lot of those in this country. Those agnostics, I would call them, they're the hardest people to talk to. Because they have all their needs met. So they don't see the reason for religion. It's hard to talk to people like that. So if you put anything on your paper... Uh, just hand it to me before we take off today, and I will ponder on it. Otherwise, I appreciate your time. Maybe next week I'll come up with some better exercises for us to do to get the blood pumping. 
our way through it. You guys, got anything for me? All right, thanks, everyone. Can we give Chad a round of applause? <laughs> <laughs>